Welcome. You have entered the realm of 1111 Talk Radio. Your host is Simron. It's time to discover your own language with the universe. Empower yourself, broaden your mind, open your heart, and discover who you are. Now, here's your host, Simron. Profound gratitude to you on this Thanksgiving week. I am so grateful for you spending time with me each and every week and listening to the wonderful guests that I'm able to bring on. It is a way for me to be a bridge between you and hopefully what you're wanting to discover. This year, I have taken liberty to really go into a lot of topics that affect us in daily life, that can really allow us to be more productive, happier, uh, allow our creativity to soar in a greater way. And there's nothing better than a good sleep. Today, we are talking about sleep and how important that is for us to live our lives, how we might be able to get better sleep, or if you're an insomniac, what you can do to be better supported. There are a lot of different methods, and today we're going to be talking to uh, Philip Cargom, who has come up with a six-step program for better sleep. The book is beautiful. It really does go into quite a few different areas that will support you in calibrating your day and your evening to enhance the sleep that you have and also what you receive through it. I love in the book at the end, he talks about trees and how trees have their own sleep cycles and being in contact with trees is really good for our health. So one tip I'm going to give you right off the bat that he talks about is forest bathing and walking amongst the trees, breathing that forest air in and allowing the essential oils that are exuded by trees to boost your immune immune system. And if you're menopausal, forest bathing can really help to improve your sleep. We're also going to go into a little bit about mushrooms and also some different types of methods that you can encounter that will support you. My guest today is Philip Carr-Gom, and he is the author and psychotherapist trained in psychology, sophrology, and psychosynthesis psychotherapy. He is the founder of Sophrology Institute, and he works in the emerging field of psychedelic psychotherapy with the ACER Integration Community that was founded by Dr. Rosalind Watts. Philip runs a sleep clinic that offers online sleep therapy, and he's the author of more than 20 books, including Empower Your Life with Sophrology, Seeking Teachings Everywhere, and the prophecies. And today we're talking about his book, The Gift of the Night. And sleep and a good night is definitely a gift. Welcome, Philip, to 1111 Talk Radio. Hello, Simran. Lovely to be here. I love a good sleep. And I've had periods in my life where sleep has been incredible. And then I've had periods in my life where sleep has been difficult. And there's nothing worse than having a night where you just keep waiting to fall asleep and you keep looking at the clock and it's like it never comes. And so I think now more than ever, this is a really important topic because there's so much stress that we encounter on a daily basis and that we carry in our bodies, some of what we don't even realize. In addition to how we've really changed from, I think, what we were meant to be naturally. I'd like you to start off first by talking a little bit about who we are as natural beings in regards to circadian rhythms and what has shifted us out of being as natural as we are uh, to to create this lack of sleep that so many do encounter. Mm, That's a good question because, of course, our lifestyles are so, so different from, you know, the thousands of years of our of our ancestors and those who came before us. And one of the, I think, at one level, in you know, sleep, all we need is a relaxed body, a calm mind, and the right circumstances for sleep. So it seems very simple. But just obtaining those three things, getting into that state where your 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 body is relaxed, your mind is calm, and you have the right circumstances uh, to, in order to go to sleep, just those three things can be really difficult to achieve for many of us, given the kind of lives we're leading. 
I think there's a, probably a lot of factors in our modern day world that really contribute to sleep issues. And that mm. might be a place to start today is to help individuals understand what might be hindering their sleep to start with. And then as we figure that out, maybe we can then go into some of the other questions. Sure, absolutely. Well, you know, if you take if you take this business of uh, having a relaxed body, you know, there's so much tension, so much stress that we have now. And so one of the, one of the things that it's really important to do is to is to work out what relaxes you and what kind of relaxation routines you can do. So all these uh, approaches like like yoga, like Pilates, all the ways that we can do to find out how to relax is are really important. They kind of set the background. And you have to ask yourself, if if I'm not relaxed in my body or can't achieve that relaxed state, we can't be relaxed all the time because sometimes we need tension and we actually need stress. One of the misunderstandings around stress can be that we have to eliminate all of it. But but we know now that that's not the case and that we do actually need certain amounts of stress in order to, to function in a healthy way. But once we determine whether or not we're, we're overly stressed, then it's a question of looking for ways to de-stress. I happen to like very much this system called sophrology, which isn't very well known in the um, in the English speaking world. It's very big in the French speaking world, and because I speak French, I'm able. I was able to train in it, and uh, I find it hugely helpful. It was developed by a neuropsychiatrist, uh, uh, you know, who just recently died, actually, and and. Um, so, so in 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 the book, really, what the, what 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 I say is that you start right from the beginning in your approach to sleep. That you have this paradox that sleep is one of those things that, um, as the psychiatrist Viktor Frankl said, it's like a a white dove that settles on your hand and flies away as soon as you pay it attention. So, one of the things you have to tackle right from the beginning is this paradoxical thing that, in order to fix your sleep and to make your sleep better. You have to give it some attention. If you give it too much attention and you try too hard, then it has the opposite effect. It's like that for meditation. I don't know if you've experienced that, but if you if you try too hard in meditation, then it's counterproductive. So you have to do this do this kind of double act of, on the one hand, wanting to succeed, wanting to do it, but on the other hand, relaxing into the process at the same time. So let me pause you right there because some might hmm. not understand what working too hard or wanting it too much might be and 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 that would just mean someone really saying oh, i can't sleep i really want to get a good night's sleep tonight i've got to get a good night's sleep that they create additional stress and worry around being able well, to sleep yeah that's exactly it because we now know that worry is bad for us the problem happens is as you lie in bed and it, it, say you're finding it hard to get to sleep as you lie in bed and worry you then remember that worry isn't good for you. So you worry about the fact that you're worrying. So you're kind of double worrying, if you like. And one of the one of the major kind of orientations that I suggest, and, and which is why I call the book The Gift of the Night, is that that you treat the night. It's very easy to dread the night. If you find it hard to sleep, the night can become something that you don't look forward to at all. But what I suggest is that you try to reframe it and to understand the night as, as a real gift. We all feel, I think, that we, we don't get enough me time. There's so many pressures during the day, and we wish to have me time. But the reality is we get about eight hours of me time every night when it's just, you know, it's us during the night. And so if you take this as like a, as a mini retreat, as a retreat time where you realize that you can use this time not necessarily to sleep but just to rest to listen to music to listen to 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 to, to try different ways of meditating that you've come across to, and then i suggest in my book 13 ways that you can you can uh, spend your time during the night in order to drift into sleep you know, I think there's probably a, a real light bulb moment even right there for a lot of people because to embrace sleep as me time. A lot of people think that sleep time is like a waste of time or I'm not getting anything done. And you know, the ancient masters talk about how we really all need to do more nothing. 
But in Mm. our Western world, to take time away from our day to do nothing seems illogical, even though it probably would make us more productive. But then they turn around and think sleep might also be a, a waste of time because we're just so fast. So talk a little bit about that aspect of it. Yeah, yeah as, exactly. And p- people who think that way, and it's extreme, it's called sleep hacking. And the logic goes, you know, why waste a third of your life being unconscious uh, when when you could get stuff done and you could be awake and you could have more life? And so people have developed ways of uh, rescheduling their sleep uh, that are are really very dangerous and they you should only really contemplate this if you're going to row aw- around the world in a boat on your own for instance but but um they involve for instance sleeping for one hour waking yourself up staying awake for an hour then having a 20 minute nap and then after two hours having another 20 minute nap and then sleeping for an hour and so on the different kind of schedules there's a whole bunch of different schedules all with horrendous names like the Dymaxion schedule and the Uberman schedule and so on. And they're all based on the complete misunderstanding of the value and the function of sleep. They they place the conscious rational mind on a pedestal and don't understand that the unconscious, the world of dreams, the world of deep sleep, uh, uh, you're by no means uh, doing nothing. There's a lot happening. Your cells are regenerating in deep sleep. Your memory is being consolidated. Um, you know, you're working through emotional issues in your dreams. You may be accessing wonderful uh, states of uh, uh, consciousness in your dreams as well and receiving insights and uh, having all sorts of experience. There's a whole lot of stuff going on while you're asleep that's extremely helpful to you. And um, and and if you if we broaden our understanding of the night to see the night as a retreat time as a special time, you can start to see what's what's happening. Imagine um, a friend uh, shows you around their house, and they say they stop as they show you room after room. You know they stop at a door and they say, "And you know, Simram, I have a room that's dedicated to changing consciousness. This room mm-hmm. is." Ask for change. You'd say, well, what is that? You'd wonder, wonder what that's saying. They open the door and it's, it's the bedroom. Right? And that's essentially what the bedroom is. It's a place where you change consciousness, where you go and you change consciousness. So another suggestion I make is that you treat the bedroom like, like your ashram, uh, like a temple, like a, like a place where you do change consciousness. And that you don't have to think in this very simplistic way about, you know, I'm either awake or I'm asleep. Fact is, there are all sorts of levels of consciousness. And this is proven in a fascinating way by this phenomenon called sleep state misperception. Sleep state misperception is when people are woken up out of sleep, they're in a sleep laboratory, and so we know they're asleep by the results that's coming out of the, uh, you know, the, the scans that are coming off of them. And yet, when you wake them up, they insist they haven't been asleep. They, they feel completely conscious. They said, no, I've been awake all this time. So the kind of medical term for it is sleep state misperception. But one might also suggest that at some level of consciousness, they are indeed aware. It's just that the body has dropped away and is, is asleep. That's a so, really beautiful idea about the bedroom being this very sacred special place, this temple, hmm. this ashram, this retreat center. Hmm. Even that shift in perception makes the approach into that room, the approach toward night, different. Because I would imagine looking at it that way, an individual goes into it more heart-centered, more in their body, more with a, a grounded inner intention that is not the mind forcing something, but a collective beingness that is reclining now and choosing to relax. So even even just thinking of that in that way, I think, would create a huge shift for people it, in it, regards it, to what the space looks like in a sanctuarial type uh, way. What would you suggest it, within the room so that to make it even more conducive to that type of relaxation? Sure. Well, if you <clears throat> if if you have the ability to do this, of course, then what you do is you look for. Basically, we know from sleep science that you need 
to be able to be to be cool in the bedroom. So it's looking at the temperature, like at the darkness. Sometimes you might need to get extra uh, extra curtains or blinds that really shut out the the light. And people use aromatherapy um, and um, you know to in order to create the right kind of atmosphere. And the, the colors that are painted in the room, just uh, and whatever you have in the room, decluttering the room, all those, all those, uh, any way in which you can feel really more. And these seem very obvious, don't they? You know, but I've had clients who have, for instance, said things like to me when I've talked about it, well, you know, ever since my husband left me, I've, you know, uh, I've got some a bit of furniture. There's a coffee table on one side of the double bed, but that's okay. I can sleep on it. And I put all my mail that I get on, you know, by the table on the other side. And I have six cats, you know, and it turned out that this lady was sleeping in this kind of crazy situation. Uh, and that by de by clearing the room, by trying to get your cat sleeping somewhere else and so on, that you can, you can, you can have a better night. So, so I think, I think having, having the right circumstances and coming back to that point about worry, if, if you're treating nighttime not as a time where it's about going to sleep i must go to sleep i have to go to sleep uh if you follow cbt which is a very effective method in in in, in my approach i combine many aspects from cognitive behavioral therapy but not all of them one of the things i don't put into the mix is uh which is it, it, which is the, the core method of the cbt uses which is to say that if you're not asleep within 10 minutes or 15 minutes get out of the bed and get out of the bedroom more importantly and people who go through that tend to find that extremely difficult you're told not to clock watch but it's really hard if you're told if you're not asleep within 10 or 15 minutes get out of bed how are you going to know whether it's 10 or 15 minutes you know so you're going to be worrying about that whereas with this approach the six point program that i suggest i say you don't worry about going to sleep at all because it's not actually about going to sleep it's about you're in your ashram you're coming into it knowing that you've got this retreat this mini retreat of eight hours or so and you can just rest you can have beautiful music you can have beautiful poetry you can just allow yourself and by having that attitude by approaching it in that way you're you're more likely to go to sleep quite honestly and it's coming from a recognition that we're not just stimulus response mechanisms which is what cbt works with but we're actually souls if you like um and um and so sleep becomes this or, or the, the night becomes this adventure in consciousness that may mean you slip into sleep but maybe not maybe you'll just rest and float the reality is you will you will the more relaxed you are the less the less worried you are the more likely you are to go to sleep and then there's a whole bunch of other things you can do to help you drop down into sleep once you've got to that stage. I loved uh, seeing all the plants you mentioned and the idea of putting lavender in my room uh, just felt so appealing and so nurturing. So I love that you give many ideas within the book. And I, and I know that the main purpose of this book is to get individuals sleeping better and as quickly as possible. You hmm. provide a lot of practical information about how to tackle those specific problems and get our best night's sleep. And I would think one of uh, one very critical point that could hinder sleep would have to do with our electronic gadgets. A lot of people might have televisions in their bedroom, or so many people keep their phone right beside them. Can you talk a little bit about that part of of what hinders us in terms of our sleep? Yes. <clears throat> well, there's no there's no scientific evidence that suggests that um, electronic devices interfere with your sleep. Some some people believe that this is so and talk about electromagnetic frequencies and so on. And it's something that you might just like to try, which is re which is removing as much e electronic equipment as possible out of the bedroom, so that you're in a in a in a in a space where that's not you know a, a factor. Um, but it's, but, the, but as I said, there's no actual proof that that is, that is the case, but it's worth exploring, it's certainly worth exploring. And with a lot of, with a lot of the, um, contributing factors to a good night's sleep, there's no one factor that on its own will make a sudden difference. 
in other words you know the use of blue light for instance you know the, one of the things that happens is that we if you look at your phone or your ipad or your tv you're getting you're getting this blue wave light which is which is um which tells your brain that it's daytime basically and so the melatonin secretion doesn't work and so you stay you stay awake um so one of one of the pieces of advice is to really limit your screen time or use filters or you can get uh, blue light blocking glasses as well kind of very orangey kind of filters on them uh, there are ways that you can reduce the blue light coming in and 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 that's helpful having the right bedding is helpful having the right winding down routine is helpful and the right kind of supplementation is helpful and it's not like I mean, it may be that you strike on one thing that really does the trick, but what's more likely to happen is a synergistic effect where you're doing all these things. So what I suggest is, you know, do all these things, including trying getting rid of the electronic equipment around the bed in the bedroom. And all together, they conspire together to create this uh, atmosphere and to optimize your chances of going to sleep. And then the one once you've done that, the one big help that this can help hugely. It's such a small thing in a way, but it's so helpful, which is understanding uh, your circadian rhythm. And there's a way in which you know a lot of people know about the ninety minute, roughly ninety minute cycle, where you cycle from light sleep into deep sleep and into dream sleep, and then the cycle repeats every ninety minutes. But what a lot of people don't know is that that 90 minute cycle carries on through the day and you're going up and down through this arousal of the nervous system and then this calming of the nervous system all the way through the day. And you, you notice it particularly, say, in the afternoon, the kind of three o'clock dip or whenever it is, you, 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 and you can, but you can actually track it through the whole day. And if you wake up without an alarm clock and you just allow yourself to wake up, you wake up on a peak. And then about um, 45 minutes later, you'll have a dip. 45 minutes later, you'll be on an up and so on. So, 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 so you, and you can track it. You can track it with yawning as well. If you just jot down the time at which you find yourself yawning, you might well find it's in these 90 minute uh, gaps when you're dropping down. So how does that help you with sleeping? Well, it's as simple as this. Very many people who find it hard to go to sleep will recount what happens in the evening. And they'll say, I'm sitting on the sofa, I'm watching the television, and I feel really tired. Sometimes I even might start to fall asleep on the sofa. And I, I okay, it's time to go to bed. So I turn off the television, I shut the, you know, the house down, put the cat out, get the dog in, I go upstairs, brush my teeth, get into bed. And then I lie in bed and I can't go, to, I'm, I'm feeling wide awake. Why is that? Well, what's happened? is you've been at the trough, if you can imagine a sort of sine wave image that, that is given in the book, you know, dropping down. You're, when you fall asleep on the sofa, you're at the base of the thing when your nervous system is totally starting to really shut down. But by the time you start doing the, um, the uh, climbing up towards the peak, 40 minutes, if it takes you 20, 25 minutes to get the house shut up and you get back into it, you lie down and you're coming up towards the top. And so you're feeling wide away. So the trick is to time the bedtime, is to use an alarm clock if you need that, to time yourself to start getting to bed. You know, and I give a little formula for doing that in the book. Then you're hitting the sack literally at the time when you're dropping down into that trough. And and it's just so much easier to fall asleep then. That's so great. I know in the book you talk about how Sometimes people brushing their teeth, that will wake them up again if they were on their way to bed and to mm. plant that a little earlier. And there's so many great trip tips that are inside of the, the book, as well as many of the uh, exercises and methods that you suggest that can support people in falling asleep. We're coming up on a break, but I'd like to dip into a little bit about um, psychedelic journeys. That's become so much a part of uh, what people are talking about now in terms of trauma and PTSD and different things. And you start mm. off the book talking about um, the use of psychedelics can also be another way or 
microdosing and those types of things. We've got a hmm. couple of minutes till break. I'd love for you to just start to begin that conversation. Begin. Okay. okay. Well, what, what I realized when I was working in the psychedelic therapy field is what we're doing is we're uh, helping people move from a everyday state of consciousness to a very unusual state of consciousness in the psychedelic experience and back again well and safely. And of course, that's exactly what you're doing with sleep therapy. You're helping people to move from an everyday state of consciousness, the waking state, to a very unusual state, where the dream life and, and deep sleep, very unusual state, and then back again. And, and when, I had, when I realized we were doing the same thing, then I applied this very simple model we use in psychedelic therapy, which is set and setting and medicine. And I applied it to the sleep process. In the essence, psychedelic journeys are experiences in consciousness. We shift from our everyday awareness to a decidedly different state of consciousness. In sleep, we do the same thing. If you suffer from insomnia, you are suffering from a difficulty in making that shift. From the waking state to that of sleeping and dreaming. For this reason, the understanding of the power of set and setting used in psychedelic therapy for making successful journeys into altered states translates very well into the use for sleep therapy, and it will guide our journey through the steps that Philip is going to talk about as we go into the next segment of the show. Once again, I am with Philip Cargom. You can find out more at his website, philip, P-H-I-L-I-P, C-A-R-R hyphen G-O-M-M dot com. His website is listed in the show notes as well. And if you are a therapist or a counselor, on December 12th, he has a two-hour online course that he is offering helping clients with insomnia. So you might want to check out his website in regard to that. Again, we are talking about the book, The Gift of the Night, where he shares a six-step program for better sleep. Go to philipcar-gom.com. We'll be right back after these messages. Follow Voice America at Facebook.com forward slash Voice America for juicy updates from your favorite radio shows and podcasts. Have you seen 1111? Do you wonder why certain numbers keep showing up in your life? 11, 111, 22, 33, 444. People all over the world are seeing 1111 and learning the language of universal communication. Subscribe to 1111 Magazine today, www.1111mag.com. 1111 Magazine is a bi-monthly print publication that offers a rich, multi-sensory experience. As you engage with experts and topics of consciousness, become enlightened, empowered, and energized so you live a passionate and authentic life of conscious choices. 1111 Magazine, a daily staple for lifting the mindset, discovering the heart, and stepping into conscious living. 1111 Magazine. Order now at www.1111mag.com. 1111mag.com. Do you want more? More joy, more abundance, more power and presence? How would it feel to have more loving relationships? more empowered community, greater fulfillment, and life purpose? The 1111 Mastermind Community inspires, empowers, guides, and supports transformation. Shift your mind, expand your heart, deepen insights, let go and chart a new course, dream a new dream. The 1111 Mastermind Community is an online portal for personal transformation and soulful expansion. Go to courses.1111mag.com. That's courses.1111mag.com. Change begins with you. Let it be simple, convenient, and transformative. The time is now. Step through the 1111 gateway. Courses.1111mag.com. Live up to your fullest potential. This is the Voice America Empowerment Channel. You are listening to 1111 Talk Radio. 
Simron is an award-winning author, publisher of 1111 Magazine, powerful speaker of wisdom, and a life mentor. Find out more at IamSimron.com. Now, back to 1111 Talk Radio. Book, the Gift of the Night. I want to mention my latest trilogy. If you are looking for something to marinate with as you fall asleep, this is a trilogy which is the manuals of the soul. The soul is speaking to you about what you're going to encounter in this life, exactly how to handle it and move through it. The three books are actually you. They are divided up into the three different aspects of you. Living the seven blessings of human experience is the personality, the identity, the conscious and unconscious person that is walking in the world, and all of the blessings, the alternative blessings that you will encounter, the things that we all come across, like challenge, obstacles, chaos, and so on, the types of blessings that have us grow, but that often we resist. The second book is Being, The Seven Illusions That Derail Personal Power, Purpose, and Peace. This is your underworld. This is the animal, the shadow, and even the monster within you that we must embrace and fall in love with, that we must discover and uncover. And when we integrate that part, all of a sudden we become more whole. And the third book, Knowing the Seven Human Expressions of Grace, is your humanity. We think we have humanity, but if we look at our world today and the things that are happening, we'll quickly understand that much of our personal humanity might be missing. This gets you back in touch with your humanity so that you can rise up to a higher octave and be your full expression. I always advise these are not books that you're going to read through very quickly. You really are only meant to read about a paragraph at a time. You can open one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and one in the evening and allow these thoughts of consciousness to marinate inside. They might also be a good way to enhance your sleep. Some people think that the time we spend in bed is wasted because we are not conscious. That's why they get into sleep hacking, trying to sleep less so they can be more productive. But they're really missing the point and falling into the trap, the hubris of the ego, the rational conscious self that thinks they're the only kid on the block. In reality, it's a time when another part of you is able to soar, to breathe freely, and to experience life in a different way. It may be a dar dark and inaccessible to your conscious mind, but your unconscious, your soul, your deep self is alive and well during this third of your life. So it makes sense to honor this part of you. This is from Philip Cargom's book, The Gift of the Night, a six-step program for better sleep. And I love the idea that he presented about making your bedroom your sanctuary, your temple, your ashram and creating the rituals that he shares in this book as well. You can find out more about Philip at philipcar-gom.com. Also check out the online course for therapists and counselors, December 12th, Helping Clients with Insomnia. Welcome back, Philip. In this book, you do go into a six-step program in addition to different ways that people can get to sleep, 13 different ways, in fact, Talk a little bit about the six-step program, and I think we, in the last segment, f talked a little bit about psychedelics, and are psychedelics part of this program, or does this six-step program go beyond uh, that type of thing and, and really talk more about the preparation of sleep? Yeah, yeah. No, you don't You don't need to, to take psychedelics at all with this program. What I've done is I've taken this uh, a kind of lens that we look at uh, the process with in psychedelic therapy and applied it to sleep therapy. It's very simple. It's set, setting, and medicine. And, and what's meant by that is in psychedelic therapy, what happens is you have to get the set right. And set is mindset and heart set, which is how you think and feel about life and your experience and about the journey you're about to take is, is very important if you're going to take psychedelics. It affects the journey. And um, the setting is the environment you take it in. So you don't want to take it in a, in a club or in the street. You take it in a warm, supportive environment and so on. That's the setting. And then medicine is the kind of psychedelic you take and the dosage and so on. If you apply this to sleep therapy, it goes like this. Uh, and this is where the six-step six program comes in. 
is the first thing to get right is your mindset, how you think about sleep. Now, you might think that's just kind of conceptual and not really relevant, but what, what they've discovered is that actually understanding sleep and how you think about it, the ideas you have about it, really do seem to affect the quality of your sleep. So um, nobody's quite sure why that is, but it may be something around us having a sense of agency. We're empowered if we, you know, knowledge is power, as Francis Bacon said. So, so the first thing is, is, is to get those thoughts about sleep, which is why I start with the idea of the gift of the night, reframing, coming to, to think about sleep in a certain way. And then you move on to your feelings around it, how you feel. This is where we go a little bit deeper and you start to, to uh, you know, really engage with your feeling self. And if you're, if you're having trouble, say, in your relationship at, at the emotional level, then that's bound to interfere with your sleep. And what, what you may need to de- do is to work on that as well, in addition to any direct work on, on your sleep. If you're troubled emotionally, then that's the time to work with a thera- therapist or a counselor in order to resolve that. And that will have a knock-on effect. There's this huge relationship between people's psychological issues and their sleep. So once you've, those are the first few steps, and then you get into the next step, which is, um, oh, and then, then, and then there's the, the set of your body, if you like, is getting the body right. So there's, there's some very interesting research that's been done around supplementation and so on. You know, magnesium, vitamin B, and so on. And there's, there's, there's a lot to talk about here, melatonin and so on. So, so in that step, you really take a look at the, uh, uh, at the physical level levels of exercise, um, and so on, the relationship to weight, and so on. So when you've, when you've kind of uh, done some work on that and got ready for that, you then uh, move into the setting. And setting is very simply it, the, the bedroom, which we've talked about already. It's just making sure that, you know, there's a, there's a little detail, for instance, that um, men and women's uh, basal metabolic rates are different, and they, and they tend to feel... Um, one partner will feel hotter and the other feel cooler. And so simple things like putting in different weights of uh, bedding on different sides of the bed, use it using maybe the same uh, duvet cover, but having two single duvets of different weights slotted into that cover so that you're both comfortable uh, makes, makes a lot of sense. But getting the temperature right. And um, so those practical details there, what's called uh, in conventional sleep medicine, it's called sleep hygiene. But I have a problem with that word because if somebody starts teaching you sleep hygiene, there's this suggestion that some somehow your sleep habits were unhygienic and dirty, which is which is rude. I don't like it. So why use sleep hygiene? It feels very kind of 1930s. Um, so instead, we're talking about setting the setting that you're using. Then you move to the very end, the juicy part, if you like, which is the medicine. Which is, in other words, how do I get to sleep? Okay, I've I've, I've got my mindset and my heart set and my setting all right, how am I going to get to sleep? I'm lying there in bed. Okay, look, before you get into uh, mm. the medicine aspect, yeah. you know, as I was reading through, and, and many people may not know, but there's there has to be somewhat of an understanding of how we're messing up different physical and physiological processes when we mm. don't allow for sleep. And I thought one of the important points that you brought up was that 60% more space is created between the neurons that make up the brain in order to allow your spinal fluid to wash through and flush out this buildup of a protein, um, mm. which then forms the sticky plaque that kills brain cells. And that's what's mm. often found in Alzheimer's disease. And mm. so when we look at some of these diseases that are rising uh, in the world and, and how more and more people seem to be... Um, encountering these things, it Mm. really is important to allow ourselves to have that sleep, to allow the melatonin to be produced, to allow the different um, parts of our body to clear. I know in Chinese medicine, it's between, I think, 1 and 2 a.m. that it's the liver's time, and then there's another period where it's about Mm. the pancreas and all of these kinds of things. And so when you talk about these steps of working with the mental and the feeling and even preparing the body and the space, mm. all of that is is health related. It, it makes it 
a holistic endeavor that then really does impact our health and our wellness. Can you say any more about the physiology or physiological mm. consequences that happen when we don't let ourselves sleep? Yes, exactly. Well, what I do, which is kind of different to a lot of books on 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 sleep and insomnia, is go into lots of details about how bad it is for you if you don't get enough sleep. Because, and the reason I do this is, A, you know, there are plenty of other books that talk about that. And uh, B, because you don't want to worry. And I always feel that it's probably counterproductive to worry clients about the negative effects of not getting enough sleep. So I just glance at it, you know, I just mention it in passing, but I don't go into any great detail. But since you've asked me about it, I mean, that, that, that particular process that you uh, referred to, the flushing out of the beta amyloid plaque, uh, is the most extraordinary process. It's the most beautiful, it's sort of wonderful, really, that the body is so sophisticated that it does that, and it does it in deep sleep. And there's this flushing of the toxins that occurs. And in fact, a big medical breakthrough has just occurred in the last um, year where they've discovered a drug that can help to remove beta amyloid plaque from brain cells. And they think this may really help in combating Alzheimer's. So it's very exciting. But we have a natural uh, mechanism to do that in deep sleep, which is why it's really important to get deep sleep. So, so that's 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 why uh, that's why I'm passionate about this work, and why um, and and the fact that that sleep as a as a as a problem affects so many other things. This incredible link between sleep and depression, for instance. If you can get uh, people who are experiencing depression sleeping well, then they can experience a really major shifts in their moods in a positive direction, which can really help to lift the depression. So, so, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really important. And it's, and it's not, as you, as you may have kind of guessed from reading through the book, it's not that difficult. It's not very complicated. You get the set right, you get the setting right. And then, and then you may well, if you can, if you go to bed, following that uh, method that I mentioned of understanding the cycle, the circadian rhythm, if you, if you manage to lie down at just the right moment when you're dropping down in that way, you may not need any special techniques, but... Well, I wanted to go into a little bit of the physiological effects that happen as you go into this medicine, because it really is almost like medicine to be able mm. to find a technique or, or method that can allow us to sleep. Um, to get our sleep architecture, as you called it, in mm. a, a regular way of life. And so mm. now, please go into some of the, um, the the ideas you had around choosing the medicine or some of the methods that you found to be so supportive that are written in the book. Yeah, okay. So, 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 so here, um, I give the, 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 the method that is uh, promoted in cognitive behavioral therapy, which is called progressive muscle relaxation which is basically a routine where you tense and relax muscles gradually working up the body. And I give a script for that in the audio book. You can, you can you know, listen to it in, in the, in the physical book, you, you know, the ebook, you can read it. Um, but it's, it's a, it's a method that's used uh, in CBT successfully. But what I then suggest is that there are these other methods that come out of alternative approaches and spiritual traditions like yoga nidra, for instance, which don't have the evidence base that CBT has because the money hasn't been spent and the time hasn't been spent doing the research. But nevertheless, thousands of people swear by it and they're extremely effective. So, so yoga nidra is one, which is a wonderful method of, of basically moving your consciousness around your body in certain ways and and more and that has an incredibly soporific effect and um again i give a script but there are also plenty of yoga nidra routines on youtube and on recordings online and uh, i give a dozen recordings on my website for instance that you can access um but um so there's yoga nidra there's hypnotherapy uh, the sophrology, which has a particular uh, exercise for programming uh, your mind to have a good night's sleep. Um, 
and uh i'm just trying to think of all of them there's so many of them well there's uh, so many they're beautiful and the scripts are beautiful and again i i want to mention not only the book but yes the audio book because if you were really wanting to experience these methods that he's talking about the scripts are really beautiful to hear them and to let yourself fall asleep by them I'd love to go back to something, Philip, um, and it's one of the reframes, and you do a really good job in the book about how to reframe some of the ideas that we might have about sleep. Mm. And, but one that you wrote down was that we have to reframe that instead of sleep being your enemy, or the night can be your friend, instead of the night mm. being your enemy, it can be the friend. And I don't know that that's something that an individual would consciously come to the realization that they see the night as an enemy and to make it a friend. But that's a very powerful reframe. It is, isn't it? It's 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 a like it's like um it's like um making um time your friend too. You know, uh those of us who lead really busy lives, it's very easy. I realized uh a number of years ago that I had this unconscious relationship with time where time was my enemy because I never had enough of it. I was always uh, racing against time, trying to fit everything in that I wanted to do. And and so I really spent time befriending time um, and using a mantra that came to me of, um, you've got all the time in the world, which my rational mind said, are you crazy? That's not true. you know. But I find that if I tell myself, you've got all the time in the world, uh, it slows me down. And it it enables me to do more, funnily enough, because I'm coming I'm coming at the problem or the work, the piece of work I have to do in a calmer, more more relaxed and clear way. Um, so befriending sleep is, you know, and you you because you have in the extremes, you have you know half of the book is is called um, almost everything you've ever wanted to know about sleep, and it's it's presented as FAQs about. Um, sleep and particularly sleep difficulties because sleep difficulties extend beyond insomnia i mean they extend into um various parasomnias as they're, as they're called things like sleep walking and sleep talking and exploding head syndrome and um also sleep phobia and some people are actually frightened to go to sleep in the in the extreme and um maybe because something traumatic happened when they were asleep um a whole bunch of reasons why that might be the case um but it's important to know that and to understand that so that you can help people who, who may be experiencing this I, I like how you also mentioned some different methods that people can do i use an eye pillow myself when i sleep because i need the light to really be blocked out and i find that i get a much deeper richer sleep in that way but you went into in the book how the pressure of that actually stimulates the vagus nerve and it influences mm. the heart and the lungs and digestive system. And so there are all these added benefits from some of these very simple things that an individual can do to not only enhance their sleep, but enhance their health. And I know that the vagus nerve has become a, a really big topic in mm. recent years, especially due to PTSD, to trauma. Uh, to depression, to all these different things that affect our, our nervous system. Do you have anything else you want to add in, mm. around that or any of the other uh, well, simple techniques that you share? Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for mentioning that, because in a way, I'm going to take back what I said earlier about about how no one technique is 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 going to. That's not actually true. The, the 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 on the whole, I would say that we're talking about synergistic effects by you know doing a bunch of things that together help you to get to sleep. But it's also true that one particular thing can really make a big difference and can maybe tip you into having a good night's sleep as opposed to not. And and the, the eye mask is a good example of that. I have friends who have experienced that, who've said, hey, you know, in your book, the little tip about eye masks has really helped us. And it's just been what we needed. And it's the same thing with, with any of the magnesium, for instance, taking magnesium supplementations if you get um, uh, night terrors, for instance, that can have, you have an, kind of almost instant effect on improving your situation and um likewise with the methods for going to sleep what i what i say in the introduction to these 13 medicines if you like or ways of dropping into sleep 
is that it's possible that just one of them will hit the spot and will be just what you need. Uh, maybe you need to explore them all and then home in on one and keep trying. Or you may just find one straight away. So there's there's a particular method that I suggest called the autogenic lat- lateral scan, which is so simple that just involves becoming aware of each of your limbs one at a time, set, um, running your awareness up them, sensing their weight and their temperature and the space they occupy, and then flipping over in your mind to the opposite limb and then over to the upper limb and then across and so on, and then down the body. Very simple to learn, easy to learn. And again, there's a script for it in the in the book. But a lot of people find that just that one technique is is all they need, and that just sends them off, you know. Um, so thank you for mentioning that, Simra. Yes, you have quite a few really beautiful uh, techniques within there. And I know Jin Shin Jutsu is, is another one. And my guest next week is Dr. Stephanie Mines, and she talks a lot about that type of method. So I was really appreciative of the 13 ways that you had so beautifully laid out within this book that possibly could introduce people to a lot of other things. EFT tapping was another one that you talked about um, mm. quite a bit as well. As you work with therapists and counselors in regard to uh, helping clients with insomnia, I know you've got that online course that's coming up. Mm. Talk a little bit, especially since you yourself are a psychotherapist, talk a little bit about how important that is for one's practice, considering so much that we're facing in the world today. Yeah. Well, one of one of the interesting things is that if you if you ask counselors and psychotherapists um, whether they inquire about the sleep of their clients, surprisingly, very few do. Um, that. Although it's so important, it's what I find with clients when I work with them. I, very early on in our discussions, I will I will ask them about their sleep, and it may not be an issue for them at all, but it also can be an issue. And I cite in the book the example of a client I had who who came to me because he was suffering from depression, found he couldn't wake up in the morning, uh, couldn't couldn't summon the energy, the motivation to get out of bed in the morning, and so on. And it was you know proving proving really problematic. We went straight into his sleep habits and found that his particular chronotype, and chronotype is the fancy word for, you know, we talk about larks and owls, people who do well in the morning, people who do well in the evening, and and, and there, are, there, there's, there are at least four of those different types. Um, it found out that he was, he was an owl trying to be a, a lark, and by adjusting his sleep times when he went to bed, when he woke up, he was able to free himself of the depression. So it's really important to understand sleep if you're going to be working with clients. And um, and so that's one of my interests is in, in working with therapists and, and counselors to give them uh, an understanding of this. And, and it's also something that is relatively quick to learn as well. That's beautiful. We have just a couple of minutes left and mm-hmm. I'd love for you to share a little bit about what got you started in this work and it had to do with the golden mean. Well, actually, I don't know that we have time. So if you want to know <laughs> <laughs> what got Philip into this work and uh, and the part about the golden mean and the ratio, then you're going to have to pick up, pick up this wonderful book. More than one third of adults suffer from insomnia or some other kind of sleep disorder. Left unaddressed, lack of sleep can lead to debilitated health, lowered resilience, and decreased performance in all aspects of life. Restoring Hope to the Sleepless psycho- is psychotherapist Philip Cargom, and he reveals how we each have the ability to unlock better sleep naturally. Combining his knowledge of sleep science and cognitive behavioral therapy with techniques drawn from spiritual traditions and insights from the emerging field of psychedelic therapy, Philip presents a fast and easy-to-follow six-step program to help you sleep better, helping you get a better night's sleep This concise and simple guide shows you how to benefit from everything the night offers to the body and the soul. I urge you to get your copy of The Gift of the Night, a six-step program for better sleep. Go to his website, philipcarr-gom.com. And again, his online course for therapists and counselors starts December 12th. It's two hours where you can help clients with insomnia. Thank you, Philip, for being on 1111 Talk Radio. Until next week. I am Simran, in love, of love, with love and as love. Be well.
Thank you for opening your mind to a new reality, your heart to greater compassion, and your experience of aliveness with 1111 Talk Radio. Join host Simron next Tuesday at 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern Time to step through the gateway of conscious living here on the Voice America Empowerment Channel. Remember, you are not on the journey. You are the journey.